नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू दिस एक्साइटिंग न्यू एपिसोड ऑफ सत्तोलॉजी डी बंकिंग मिथोलॉजी सत मीन्स ट्रुथ लोगोस मीन्स अ स्टडी ऑफ साइंस इन लैटिन एंड वेन यू कम्बाइन द टू एट टाइमोलॉजिकली यू टू एड एन एडिशनल टी बिकम सत्तोलॉजी एंड इट मीन्स अ साइंस ऑफ ट्रूथ स्टडी ऑफ ट्रूथ अपोजिट ऑफ दैट इज मिथोलॉजी विच वॉज क्रिएटेड बाय द कोलोनियल पावर्स टू इंडिया टू प्रूव दैट द एंशियंट वैदिक हिस्ट्री इज नॉट फैक्चुअल और नॉट हैज अस्टोरिकल बेसिस हैज नो आर्कोलॉजिकल बेसिस and all those kind of things were done now many of those aspects have already been debunked like the rn invasion theory is out and many other theories are gradually going out now especially the historicity of ramayana and mahabharat has been very well established by many many great scholars on this channel itself forget about other places on this channel also they have debunked it conclusively with scientific basis now today we have a very very special guest who is a sanyasi which means is the highest order of varnashram and also a guide to millions of people you can ask him questions you can ask him inputs and this is the perfect person to go to just like i was saying that when you were when you talk about dharma you are not going to go to a walmart store and ask a cashier about dharma it's not going to give you the right answer you have to go to the right person for the right answer so without delay let us welcome his holiness bhakti rasamrat maharaj hari krishna hari krishna maharaj. thank you very much hari guru prabhu for your invitation I'm happy to be back with your channel again <laughs> thank you so much maharaj for coming today there is a lot of narratives going on in social media and uh, which makes many followers of sanatan dharma uh, weak or feel helpless a uh, lot of things go on so maharaj before we start off what is the one way for people to feel strength because they're losing confidence the propaganda is so much high against sanatan dharma very different many different aspects of sanatan dharma how do people those who feel like that gain strength from within the sanatan dharma especially in this age which is called kali it is said that strength comes by association by keeping company in numbers so if one associates with people who are sincere and staunch followers of sanatan dharma then we will also get strength and enthusiasm and inspiration because the way of the world currently is such that it the current of this world goes against the flow of sanatan dharma so the sincere followers will find themselves swimming upstream so to speak so it is very important to have the company of like minded people where one can discuss one can practice the various aspects of sanatan dharma and gain strength so strength is in quality association then everything follows from there very well put maharaj because uh, you know everyone has an association there is a golf group who have an association everybody has an association where they gain strength from each other but sometimes it is being seen and i am being that many of the followers of sanatan dharma also disagree and criticize each other in some ways which actually adds to the propaganda of the opponents of sanatan dharma do you think that kind of practice is valid or what is the alternative for ordinary people who can and all of us are aam aadmi or ordinary people but from your perspective like how can people can distinguish facts from fiction like when there are multiple competing arguments in sanatan dharma i think the first and most important thing is that there must be a proper foundation for our knowledge uh it cannot just be somebody's speculation uh i cannot claim to start a new dharma neither can anybody else so dharma according to the vedas 
is that which is enunciated by God Himself. Dharmam to Sakshat Bhagavat Pranitam. That's the Sanskrit phrase from the Srimad Bhagavatam. So, whatever religion has to have, uh, or spirituality has to have a basis in scripture. And what is scripture? Scripture uh, is the word of God or of the representatives of God. And the representatives of God, who are truly representative of God, will not speak anything separate from what God himself says. So uh, that is dharma. And essentially, when one leads one life in obedience to uh, these laws, then one is said to follow Sanatan Dharma. So first and foremost, there must be um, obedience to uh, scripture. There must be everything we do must be founded on the basis of authorized uh, spiritual and scriptural knowledge. So that's, I think, a very important thing. Once that is done, uh, then a lot of things uh, are put in place we are able to understand the relative um, values and the relative uh, truths or untruths of different propositions. So that's the first step. The second is that there may be differences in how people understand the same scripture. Therefore, we have to try to see uh, what is a faithful understanding of uh, these divine books of wisdom. So we cannot be speculative. We cannot uh, interpret the words of divinity at our whims and fancies. So we have to accept the word as it is. So when our founder, I belong to the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, ISKCON, popularly called the Hare Krishnas, so our founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada, he uh, titled his translation and commentary on the Bhagavad Gita as Bhagavad Gita as it is, because he accepted the words of Lord Krishna as it is, without deviation, without change, without interpretation, you know, without speculation. So once we have these two factors, and third, we have the right company who will actually uh, teach us these things and, and they also practice it in their life, then clarity emerges. So knowledge must be on the, uh, anything, any practice of anything must be on the basis of knowledge and knowledge has to have an authorized source. You know, where, uh, you said it so well, Maharaj, and it is a great uh, inspiration for many people. Some people are commenting me live right now. They love the tone which you speak, and it's the first time many of them are listening to you. Now, the, the ma many, many religious uh, uh, and uh, I would say the Hindu studies heads of American universities, they introduce many Abrahamic concepts while teaching Hinduism <clears throat> in a big way. And what happens is that the, the many of the Hindu community, especially when it comes in the US and when it comes in the Western universities, they slowly get into the Indian academic language, lang uh, linguistics uh, and then gradually starts confusing people. Many things like... Uh, many things like uh, monotheism, like all those things come into play. Now, that creates a very confusing uh, a, a confusion that creates a lot of confusion in the minds of the Indian origin students in a big way, because these topics went from American academic institutions to Indian academic institutions. So do, do you think that Sanatan Dharma is just intellectualism or it is something beyond that, or it has encompasses intellectualism as well as practice. What do you say in that? And that's a good question. Knowledge naturally involves some degree of intellectual effort, undoubtedly. 
how can one understand and transmit knowledge unless there has been application of one's intelligence so definitely uh, intellectual endeavor is an essential part of the process but as i mentioned earlier the foundation has to be scripture the word of god it has to be authorized knowledge if the intellectualism is based on one's own whims and speculations then there is no end to where it will go uh, it will lead to an endless amount of uh, fanciful theories changing every single day actually intellectualism uh, devoid of the guidance of scripture devoid of uh, a moral compass devoid of a spiritual inclination and spiritual foundation can only lead to atheism and to other such destructive conclusions uh this is what i would call free fall intellectualism where one thing leads to another and to another and to another and it just goes awry it goes out of control so uh intellectualism is what is driving the liberal ideology today because they're applying intellectual uh shall we say analysis to situations and they're arriving at some conclusions so it is good to be liberal in a moderate sense because we cannot be tyrannical you know we cannot be oppressive we have to take everybody along with us we have to uh you know treat everyone with dignity with care that they deserve so that is what liberalism is essentially about about these good values that we want respecting the rights of the individual and so many such good ideas however when this liberalism uh, is based on free fall intellectualism unbounded intellectualism without any framework without any reference to uh, divinity or anything else like that then what happens is is that it feeds on itself and therefore you have what is in america what's called the woke culture and the cancel culture and such things and it goes to absurd levels and it ends up in what i would call brute liberalism uh brute liberalism is liberalism gone awry on the basis of too much of intellectualism analyze 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 so too much of analysis like this leads to paralysis it leads to uh, an anchorless uh, movement uh, in one's way of of thinking and acting so therefore i think that uh, intellectualism is good provided it is within the framework of uh, the boundaries uh, of a certain moral compass and spiritual knowledge from the scripture okay i hope that answers your question you covered so many points in that answer and you covered many many burning issues in north america also which is you i think i have never heard a better explanation of the origin of the wokeism in north american campuses or especially campuses all these movements have started in campuses now i'll come back to the you have touched an important point of liberalism and you put it so well that liberalism has to be with some boundaries and respecting rights of others including animal rights which is an important subject matter in sanatan dharma now most of the proponents of dharma you know i think you are the first one to comment you know people like me can comment on it but when it comes from you it makes uh, it it is a statement now when we when we uh, when we discuss sanatan dharma which is the biggest protector of rights of individuals and also animals included including trees and nature it is a very eco friendly culture now how can the the proponents of sanatan dharma or or we all of us who we can 
give a solution to that problem countering is intellectualism or out of control intellectualism intellectualism is good i myself read a lot of things but out of control intellectualism and which is resulting in wokeism or cancel culture how can we answer that question from a dharma perspective well we can say that ultimately we are from the dharma point of view we are spiritual entities we are the atma the eternal spirit soul and we are not this body when we speak of the material body we don't speak merely of the physical body that's made of flesh blood and bones but we also speak of the subtle mind and we speak of the subtle intelligence and of the subtle false ego so the material body comprises a gross aspect and a subtle aspect so generally modern science and modern thinking in general understands only the gross physical aspect of the living entity and as far as the subtler elements like mind intelligence and ego modern science considers these three to be only uh, products of the physical working of the body for example that intelligence and memory and and so on are generated by the brain in certain sections of the brain now it is a fact that certain sections of the brain may be associated with certain functions something may be associated with memory something with emotion etc that is possible however it doesn't mean that the brain is the origin of these ultimately because we are spiritual entities the origin of life and the origin of uh, the possibility of functioning of the gross and subtle physical bodies is the soul is the atma so when we become too physically conscious of our body of the physical body then that takes us away from our spiritual identity similarly if we become too focused on the mind and just our emotions and so on we are driven only by the emotions then that's also not good because then we'll end up doing so many things that are harmful to ourselves simply driven by emotions again there must be some temporary uh, you know that the flow of the emotions must be tempered by the use of the intelligence on the other hand also if we uh, emphasize too much and only the intelligence and just try to analyze everything by a uh, force of our intellectual power that also is wrong because we are not the intelligence either we are not the physical body we are not the subtle mind we are not the uh, subtle intelligence we are not the subtle false ego we are the spirit soul so when we focus on any one of these entities these these uh, aspects of our uh, body physical or subtle devoid of connection to the spirit soul it will lead us to faulty conclusions eventually bringing us grief so intellectualism is just a variation of bodily consciousness just like emotionalism is or gross bodily consciousness is ultimately because these are all centered on something that is not reality that is not the soul that is not ourselves therefore it will not lead to any harmonious conclusions so sanatan dharma teaches us that the body the mind the intelligence are all important they all have a role to play but that role must be seen in connection with the spirit soul they must be employed to attain the ultimate spiritual goal of our life if you disconnect the physical body the the subtle mind and the subtle intelligence from the ultimate spiritual goal of life then there will be trouble so then you have free fall intellectualism you have all kinds of other problems that come up <coughs> excuse me so that spiritual understanding is the key to countering such false uh, understandings of the world very well put it and like there is one shloka in bhagavad gita ab swadhyay abhyasanam like uh, which comes that uh, that's how you realize the parmatma and other things the the 
the most important aspect you mentioned and which is uh, spiritual understanding now there are many people who can i call it shloka bombing like they can drop shloka at a hint of a word but the important thing you mentioned is the practice and and more and more people try to intellectually understand sanatan dharma where they want to go into the shloka and then they go to the wikipedia which is the biggest source of disinformation in spiritual concepts is like i say wikipedia is if you want to understand sanatan dharma is like going to a, a walmart cashier or any the supermarket cashier and asking them about important such important concepts now but when it comes to spiritual understanding there is a philosophy which has come into the mind that i can intellectually satisfy myself completely spiritually also do you think that process you know we all agree that we all have to read and then practice so that intellectual is already included there but rejecting all the authorized sources all the people just saying that uh, because of the campaign of wikipedia and all the other media outlets that rejecting the source of that information or people who practice it is that a wise choice what is the process mentioned in trying to develop ourselves spiritually uh, as i mentioned right in the beginning we need the company of spiritually learned uh, people who are also practicing that in their life so the primary source of our knowledge is through such personalities and by studying the scriptures uh in accordance with how these great personalities have explained it and taught it so that is where we uh, learn our things from that's the authorized way just as if someone wants to be a doctor then uh, he or she would not go you know to a grocer to learn medical science they would have to go to medical school uh of course the grocer may be able to say so many things about health and give you know his speculations about you know how we should do certain things but that's not a, an authentic or authorized version of medical science so similarly we may find uh, different things up in the internet or in other sources about what spirituality is some of it may be true some of it may not be true and often it is not true uh therefore we have to go to the authorized uh persons and the authorized sources and then we should learn from there when we are equipped with that understanding then when we look at wikipedia or any other source we will be able to distinguish what is bona fide and what is not i'll changing a track a little bit now we all see in a democracy people are responsible for electing their own leaders and and so ultimate responsibility lies with the people and people elect the leaders and that's how they get governed and uh, and money has is playing a big role in these elections processes but generally as a guidelines so when we talk about politicians and uh, people who aspire to become a good politician there are a lot of students who are running for political offices and there are people other people will be watching this show are also looking for political offices what are the principal duties and responsibilities of running a strong government from the point of view of dharma now it's a it's a topic that requires a little bit of elaboration and it may not be possible to explain at length in the time that we have available with us to put it succinctly number 1 the word dharma is much misunderstood so dharma is seen by people often only as a kind of a religious faith so whether one belongs to this faith or that faith etc but when we speak of dharma we speak sanatan dharma we speak of something that is some principles that are eternally valid and are applicable in all times in all places and in all circumstances so these eternally valid principles of knowledge constitute sanatan dharma and 
when we apply them in our practical life, there are also certain aspects that we need to be, that they will manifest in. So uh, once you have a certain philosophy, that when you apply that philosophy in day-to-day -day life, whether it is in politics or governance or sociology or anything else, then we will have uh, certain other principles of a practical nature. So we see uh, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the great Bhagavad Purana, that there are four such principles of dharma which, uh, on which the entire society is supposed to stand. Um, so that is truthfulness, cleanliness, mercy, and austerity. So these are the four pillars of dharma. Now, regardless of which religious faith we subscribe to, regardless of uh, our ethnicity, our nationality, our, our language, and whatever else, these four principles are universally applicable. So therefore, uh, in all spheres of life, at all levels, these four principles must apply. Truthfulness, cleanliness, mercy, austerity. And what it means to have to, to do these four things is a question that will again need some discussion uh, because there are implications for each. It needs some elaboration to explain what these ter terms really mean. But in very brief, cleanliness is not only cleanliness of the body, it's also cleanliness of the mind. Cleanliness of the body means that we keep ourselves physically clean we take a bath every day, uh, sometimes more than once if required, and we wear clean clothes. Uh, we, we live in clean surroundings, our homes, our uh, places of residence, our, our streets, our, everything is clean. So that cleanliness is, is very important. Our actions must be clean. Uh, must not give rise to uncleanliness of any sort. Uh, as far as truthfulness is concerned, it is not only a question of uh, not speaking the truth in terms of day-to-day -day life, uh, in terms of our discourse with people, but also in terms of larger things. Uh, for example, um, you know, the advertising, you know, advertising is not truth, right? Because they, they promote their products in a way that uh, enhances the value of the product to some mythical proportions, some, some false proportions. And they'll give you false hopes that if you just use my product, then you will be happy. Yes. So they exaggerate things. They sometimes misrepresent things. They falsely uh, praise themselves and compare themselves favorably to other products and so on. And essentially, they try to persuade you to do something that you may not have even thought of earlier or that you may not have intended to do. So when we speak of truthfulness, we speak of all sorts of uh, truthfulness. So that's called satyam. You know, uh, cleanliness is called shaucham in Sanskrit. The next is mercy. Mercy is daya in Sanskrit. Compassion, kindness. So kindness to all living entities, to humans naturally, which means one should not um, uh, kill human beings. One should not uh, cause harm to human beings. And that includes the child in the womb that is is abortion. That's also a non-scruelty. One should have compassion on, on all human beings, but one should also have compassion on animals, birds. One should not kill them for the sake of satisfying the urges of the tongue, just to eat some food, which we think is delicious. Uh, we should not cause so much pain to other living entities. Similarly, we should not unnecessarily cut trees and so on. So uh, avoiding cruelty of all kind and being very kind and compassionate to everyone 
uh, is what daya or compassion is. And finally, austerity. Austerity uh, essentially um, means that one should follow certain rules and regulations. Austerity essentially means that you accept some things in your life because they are right and because they need to be accepted, even though you may not like it. And it also means that you don't do certain things that you otherwise would like to do because that's not supposed to be done. So what is to be done and what is not to be done is also not something that we can concoct with our own whims, but it is something that has to be prescribed by higher sources of spiritual knowledge, by the, the books of Sanatan Dharma. So when we get this knowledge of what is to be done and not done, and then we follow those rules and regulations, then we are following austerity. So, uh, and we, in a sense, we are all expected to follow austerity like we follow the laws of the state, right? There may be many laws that we don't like to follow, but then we follow it. For example, you're driving on a road and there's a speed limit and we may desire to drive faster, but then we know that we're not supposed to go beyond a certain speed limit, so we restrain ourselves. And this is just an ordinary small example, but there are many bigger issues in life, more fundamental things in life. So essentially, that is what austerity is. So these are the four pillars of dharma. So whether one is a politician or a leader of any kind, or even in a family, these are the four um, fundamental principles on the basis of which uh, the whole world should be governed, whether it's a country, whether it's a family, whether it's a, a corporation or it's a university or any gathering of people, and whether it's our own life individually. Thank you so much. And I think uh, which is uh, what is happening. Another, another thing which is being shown, like... Uh, I have captured in my books and you have spoken many, many lectures, thousands of lectures on this topic you have spoken, that how Sri Ram, when he prepared you know, to protect the right of one individual, his wife, he led a very big, uh, he, he punished them, people who were offending or transgressing this, those rights. The other aspect comes in, where Narad and Yudhishthir converse with each other, speak, and Narad Muni gives specific instructions on governance. And the emphasis was given that the king's duty is to militarily also protect their citizens. Now, and there are many other references where Arjun uh, learned from Krishna and then fought a war, which initially he was on compassionate grounds, was not wanting to fight, but later on, he, as a duty, he fought the war because that was his duty. Now, one thing has come in due to the colonial uh, imposition on the minds of Indians, where the Indians or followers of Sanatan Dharma remain always weak. So they, they try to profess all the time, peace, peace, peace. It is not possible sometimes, but they are not able to stand up because the, the Western model, again, I say the Western academic thought is completely different. They, they follow, uh, they think, according to them, that the physical strength brings spiritual maturity. And, and that's how they use it freely. Their militaries, they use it freely. And, and it has come from Middle East also. Now, what, where do the Sanatan Dharma practitioners become weak when the instructions and examples are very clear? What what is the what is the your analysis on or your solution to those people who become weak on the strength of Sanatan Dharma? Well, you know there are different duties for people in different uh, positions in life. So for those who are governing and who are responsible for the safety and well-being of others have a responsibility to do just that, to protect those under their care. And if 
those people under their care are being persecuted or harmed in some way, then these guardians or wards, or the guardians rather, should, should step in uh, to do the needful. Now, it is preferable that it is done without violence, that it is done very smoothly. However, that may not always be possible. Non-violence is a very desirable thing, but it is not an absolute principle. Uh, because there are times when uh, being non-violent may be a form of violence. For example, let's say you're, you're going with a, a very dear friend, or let's say you're going with your small daughter or small son, okay? You're walking the street and someone comes to, you know, attack or molest your child. Now, are you going to say that non-violence is the principle and therefore I will not respond? So it's an extreme example, but it illustrates the point that there will be situations when those who are responsible for uh, the care of others may need to take recourse to violent methods. But I use the word may. Uh, as far as possible, it should to be avoided. Uh, it is only when there, it, it, uh, there is no other recourse, then violence may be used as a last resort. Because if that were not so, then people will misapply this principle and whimsically use violence. And that is what is happening in many places. So the wrongful application of nonviolence and the wrongful application of violence, both are wrong. So one needs to understand what exactly constitutes nonviolence and violence. And therefore, uh, one must uh, distinguish between circumstances and that, call, and that calls for spiritual wisdom. Uh, merely exercising force uh, because one has it will boomerang eventually by the law of karma. And it will come back to harm the one who has employed it unjustly. Primarily, violence is used as a means of self-defense. And it is used as a means of protection for others. It is not and should not be employed to give pain and cruelty unnecessarily to others. So, if one understands this principle, then surely in the course of practicing Sanatan Dharma, one will do the needful. Whether one is a political leader, whether one is in charge of, you know, uh, a police officer in charge of a certain area or of, you know, father or mother who are looking after their children, etc. So these things will apply. So it has to be very carefully understood and applied. There is a different type of there is a different type of violence also goes on, which is intellectual violence, narrative, fake narrative violence, and all other kinds of violence, which also uh, you know people make people very reactive. I've seen that people, uh, the followers of Sanatan Dharma become so disturbed, and I'll blame it all on the WhatsApp artists who forward messages irresponsibly also creates a panic situation on fake narratives. Now, uh, because people have not read Shastra or scriptures, Vedic scriptures, and they do not have any guidance, any sort of guidance, like you said, association, like-minded people, it's not there. So people get very reactive. And then, and then the, so it's a one sort of depression, and another sort is overreactive, which is another sort of depression. So the balance of mind goes away. So the, what do you say about the violence by these fake narratives? And, and, and people are reactive, which is also against dharma in many, many ways. You lose the power of discrimination at that, that time. That's an important question. Uh, I spoke earlier only about physical violence. But that is not all there is to it when it comes to violence. Uh, violence can be not just physical, 
It can be, for example, emotional violence. It can be verbal violence. It can be intellectual violence. And uh, it can be spiritual violence in the sense that one tries to destroy somebody's faith in, uh, you know, in the practice of Sanatana Dharma, for example. So, yes, violence, violence is something that essentially um, takes away somebody's rights. Is a forceful means or a, a very vigorous means or a clever way when it comes to intellectual propaganda of, of taking away people forcefully or, uh, you know, with trickery uh, by subterfuge sometimes uh, into uh, methods or into areas where which are not actually uh, right. So this intellectual propaganda, etc., uh, that you referred to also needs to be countered. But it has to be countered in a certain way. Uh, as you said, uh, one cannot be either extreme. If one is too timid and simply accepts everything, and then one may get swayed by the current of contemporary uh, speculative thinking. Or if one reacts over vigorously, then one ends up, uh, you know, taking the law in one's hands, one ends up getting a bad name for Sanatana Dharma, etc. So it, it needs a response in appropriate language, in appropriate uh, methods um, to intellectually counter such uh, propaganda, uh, such, shall we say, uh, atheistic propaganda and uh, is essential, yes, but it has to be done through uh, one's own practice and propagation of Sanatana Dharma. So there is a phrase in the Sanskrit language which is Dharma Rakshati Rakshitaha. So Dharma is protected. Uh, if one protects Dharma, then Dharma protects us. You know, so the protection of dharma comes by practicing it and by propagating it. Uh, so we speak about it and that makes it available to one and all to understand. And we have to practice it in our life because if we don't practice something and we just uh, theoretically or intellectually say one thing, we only culturally identify with something, but we don't go deeper into the spiritual uh, foundations of that belief or that identity, then it will not last very long. So to answer your question, uh, propaganda of sorts has to be intellectually countered. In some cases, it may mean uh, through propaganda, it may mean through, uh, you know, a, a lobbying with uh, certain in the media or or with the government or whatever it is and that's all that everybody is doing these days those who want to advocate uh, extreme views on things they use the brute power of their numbers or being extremely vocal in the social media and so on so it needs to be countered but appropriately no, very well said, uh, very well put it, uh, uh, Maharaj. The, the, the point which I uh, usually and uh, question, ask questions, these are questions I'm asking by the students actually. They're also throwing in questions here. One of the questions being said that Sanatan Dharma has brought so much peace to their own lives and these are not from Indian, India origin people. They have brought so much peace from their life in their lives. And one question is asked, that the and I don't want to go political on this, but they say Indian government has the largest in like the India as a country has the largest practitioners of Sanatan Dharma, and it is the duty of the Indian government to propagate this message at the right level in the foreign academic institutions or the Ministry of Education or any other uh, department. Why they are not doing it? Number one. 
and my answer to them before you answer my answer to them is sanatan dharma is a individual responsibility it has nothing to do with the governments or anyone else it is a duty of a practitioner to tell others about their faith but still there is a need for an organized entity like for example uh, many of the abrahamic faiths get promoted by their own governments sanatan dharma is the only one which is not promoted by any government and so it is all up to the people so what is your view on that well historically it is true that ideologies and not just religious ideologies but any ideology has always flourished by political patronage but in today's system of democracy that political patronage comes when there are sufficient numbers that advocate and follow a certain line of thinking and then because democracy is based on numbers so then uh, the political establishment also falls in line now because we live in an age where opinions socially are fractured so large percentages of people have different types of opinions so it is hard for governments to follow any particular line uh without being excessively criticized so while political patronage for anything is 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 uh, certainly there and is being followed everywhere the communists for example they also flourish because of political patronage but they came to power by in various means uh, especially by uh, revolution by military means as one of the most important means and propaganda was a very important part of that uh, similarly those who follow liberal ideologies excessively liberal ideologies <coughs> i wouldn't say just liberal because we should all be liberal but many places they follow excessively liberal ideologies uh and because that's where the academia comes in the picture the academia also push this kind of agenda a lot they dominate the intellectual sphere uh the discourse is dominated by the media uh, by the academia it comes through the media it comes through the writings and it influences those in political power so uh we see therefore that um whether it is a particular religion or whether it's a particular ideology whether it's an atheistic ideology or anything else uh, all needs a couple of things it needs uh propaganda and by propaganda i mean it in a general sense in the sense of propagating so it needs intellectuals who will articulate very clearly uh the ideology say of sanatan dharma in our case to explain to people what sanatan dharma is to talk about the atma to talk about bhakti to talk about yoga bhakti yoga to talk about kala karma you know all the concepts of the bhagavad gita to talk about how we should chant the holy names of the lord so we need a propagation of this knowledge and at an intellectual level also we need a strengthening um of this understanding uh, by defending it from opposing ideologies who will always criticize it and we should have intellectual ability to refute opposing ideologies as well so uh, when that is done and when the number of people believing in and advocating a certain line of thinking increases beyond a certain critical mass and if they are also particularly influential intellectually then it will lead to a wider transformation uh, however we should say that in many cases uh, there are groups that punch above their own weight so to speak that's because they they have a lot of intellectuals and uh, it is unfortunate that many of the best in, uh, brains in the world today are moving into 
uh, have moved into rather kind of atheistic, uh, you know, uh, ways of thinking or thinking that focuses on excessive intellectualism where they do not uh, feel the need for anything beyond the intellect or beyond the so-called rationality or beyond so-called logic. Um, so the best brains are moving into that area. So therefore, um, they have a, a very, very dominant influence on the way that the society moves. And they are the ones who shape the values and the morals and the codes of conduct within society. So once they propagate that, they articulate it, they propagate it, the media comes on board, the political establishment comes on board, and then it spreads, it becomes common. So what it needs also, we cannot expect governments to do so many things now because uh, most political constitutions these days are of a secular nature where they have to be somewhat, you know, equally disposed towards uh, all religions. Uh, and indeed, that's a good thing because we should not discriminate. You know, we should allow uh, people of different faiths to practice. Uh, however, when that does not mean that we shouldn't be not given the freedom to practice what we believe and to propagate what we believe either. So essentially, I agree with you that it comes down to the individual and individuals must come together. They must understand this. They must propagate this. And, and gradually the critical mass will come. And then the transformation will happen step by step. Maharaj, you touch upon so many important points in such a short time and it's a daily eloquence that you have with your own sadhana and big things you have done and uh, just to let you know the viewers Maharaj has inspired millions of people across continents in India don't, in don't exaggerate it's not <laughs> millions <laughs> probably more in India in, in South America in US in uh, Europe and many other parts of the world. Thank you for everything that you do, Maharaj. And uh, viewers, do comment on YouTube and let us know your feedback. And we'll come back again with another topic for Maharaj on something very important. I'll discuss with him privately, which you have already asked me right now. The time is up. Our video, you know, we are at the top of the limit for our live transmission. So thank you, Maharaj, for coming on the show. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you.